Fertility Friday Q&As, answering your top questions. Hey friends, welcome to this new series I'm doing on YouTube, which is a fertility Q&A. You can ask these questions under the community tab. There is a setting that says, ask your fertility questions. And every Friday, I'm going to be releasing a video answering a few of these. So no matter where you came from, you can go put a question there and I'm going to be highlighting some of them and pulling them here. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and I am here to educate you about your fertility because I'm very passionate that you deserve the answers to these questions about how your body works and I wanna demystify the fertility experience. So without any further ado, I'm going to dive in, but my first ask is please subscribe to the channel. Please share it with your friends. This is how we break the stigma of infertility and we learn more about our bodies. How likely is a successful pregnancy and birth after removal of uterine adhesions? If it's not successful, are there other options? Would IVF be the next step? This is a good question. Let's break down some things I get asked about all the time. Uterine adhesions are scar tissue inside the uterus. This can be caused from a variety of different factors. So some of these can be caused from prior infection inside the uterus, but honestly, the top cause is from prior instrumentation or having instruments put inside the uterus. Number one is an emergent scenario where you have a dilation and curettage or you're scraping or sucking out part of a placenta in a miscarriage or postpartum situation with heavy bleeding. This can leave adhesions and scar tissue inside the uterus. Other reasons why we see it is post uterine surgery. You only have one uterus. Those of us in the field consider it to be very valuable. So doing things like cutting out fibroids, we have to be cautious that the benefit is higher than the proposed risk of getting scar tissue inside your uterus. And occasionally we can see this from prior IUDs, if an IUD is inserted wrong, or if there were complications or complications from any type of intrauterine procedure. It's more rare to get uterine adhesions from an early, early miscarriage when you have a DNC or a suction procedure, a manual uterine aspiration, or from an early abortion. The later you are, the more that placenta has invaded and the more risks that may exist. Essentially, when the uterus has scar tissue on the inside, it's called Asherman syndrome. Asherman syndrome is obliteration of the uterine cavity. Complete obliteration can cause absence of periods. So when somebody comes in who previously had periods and now they're not, one of the things I try to figure out is, are you ovulating or is there an obstruction? And so when you have Asherman syndrome, what happens is scar tissue has replaced the endometrium or that lining of the uterus. Therefore, it can't regenerate and there's nothing there to bleed. Some cases of Ashermans are really mild. You can resect the scar tissue and everything will be fine. Some are really severe and some patients will never be able to have a normal uterine lining or get pregnant again afterwards. It's a very serious thing. Anytime you have scar tissue inside the uterus, it should be removed. The procedure to remove scar tissue is called hysteroscopy, which is putting a camera through the cervix and into the uterus. You can then look inside the uterus and take pictures. And from there, you're able to take tiny little scissors, put them through the cervix into the uterus and cut, cut, cut away all the scar tissue. I did a ton of these in training and I'm a strong believer in trying to prevent adhesions from coming back after resection of scar tissue. So this protocol that I like to use includes a balloon or a stent inside the uterus, high dose estrogen and some antibiotics. That way we can try to encourage that uterine lining to grow and to recover. Very often patients who've had prior scar tissue may have difficulty achieving a normal thickness of the lining and sometimes they may need extra medications or certain protocols to do this that may not happen in a natural cycle. In a natural cycle, your uterus has to be ready by the time you ovulate an egg, period, the end. So very often in cases with Ashermans, I recommend going through IVF, getting embryos, freezing embryos. Then we can go through and try to heal the uterus, do the surgery, do that post-operative treatment. Then we can synchronize when the lining is best with when an embryo is best. And that way we can have the highest chance of synchronizing up, getting that best lining possible and optimizing the case of live birth. What are the possible explanations for a woman to not be ovulating? Why could a woman with lots of egg counts not be ovulating with irregular cycles in her early 30s? 
So first of all, even when women have really low egg counts, they tend to still ovulate. Having low ovarian reserve or a low egg count is not something that causes an ovulation or failure to ovulate. And on the other end of the spectrum, one of the top causes of not ovulating is PCOS. PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. I have a whole video on that, so feel free to go watch and learn more. But in PCOS, the basic simplest way to explain it is that you have a lot of eggs, so you actually have a very high egg count. All these eggs come out of that vault inside the ovary and they confuse the brain. The brain sends out a normal amount of FSH, but the ovaries are not able to respond appropriately because the signal gets diluted. So you get stuck in a weird phase with irregular bleeding. Overall, different causes of abnormal bleeding can be one, PCOS, two, thyroid abnormalities. So we should always check a thyroid in people with irregular periods. Number three, abnormalities of prolactin. Prolactin is made from the pituitary gland, which is the same gland in the brain that sends out FSH and LH, hormones that control ovulation. When you have high prolactin levels, you actually see a shift in your ovulation pattern, meaning mildly high, and you get periods that are really close, like a luteal phase defect. A medium, you then start to skip months and you have them a little bit further apart. And really high, you have amenorrhea or total absence of periods. So a prolactin should also be checked in all people with abnormal cycles. Then we have other causes. So other things that can impact your regularity of your periods, you can be on the other end of the spectrum. So your brain may not be sending out hormones quite as well. That can be hypothalamic amenorrhea. That's typically not irregular periods. It's usually absence of periods. And that's typically seen with extreme states of stress. So whether it's stress, calorie deficiency, exercise intensity, or chronic illness, we tend to see the brain shut off and not send out some of those hormones. And that can take years to recover from. Other causes can include abnormalities inside the uterus that have nothing to do with your hormones. So sometimes we see polyps or fibroids that can cause abnormal bleeding patterns. Obesity is another thing. Your fat cells make estrogen and that can confuse the uterine lining. So even in obese women who don't have PCOS, we sometimes see an overgrowth of the lining that becomes unstable. And I'll add in because of timeliness, sometimes we see any big inflammatory response or sickness. So if you get really sick, your period may get off. Same thing with we're seeing with the COVID vaccine. The endometrium or the lining of your uterus is an immune tissue and it's immune responsive. This is something well known because the immune system is really important in implantation. But what we're seeing is with any big immune response, it may cause destabilization or abnormal periods that should be very short lived. Okay, last one for this series, cervical mucus and fertility. Do you have healthy eggs if you get cervical mucus every month? Birth control, how long does it normally take for hormonal birth control to be out of your system? Okay, these are great questions and they're kind of separate. So let's go over the first one, cervical mucus and fertility. Cervical mucus is checked by putting two fingers inside, pulling out, literally pulling out and stretching. And what you should see is you're looking for type four cervical mucus, which is caused by high estrogen levels. It's a thinning out. We like to consider it like an egg white. So imagine if you dipped your fingers in egg whites and stretched it, that's what you would be seeing. What you should usually do is start after your period ends, putting your fingers inside, pulling out and stretching. And when you see that type four, that's a sign of high estrogen. That's the day you should be ovulating and you should time intercourse around that day. It has nothing to do with healthy eggs. It has to do with ovulation and production of estrogen. When we think of healthy eggs, we tend to think of genetic normalcy, which is number one, most influenced by your age. As we get older, we've all heard that terrible term of being 35 as a geriatric pregnancy or advanced maternal age, it's because those chromosomes have been held apart for 35 plus years and those meiotic spindles that hold them apart start to break down. So they split abnormally and you see an increased prevalence of genetic abnormalities. So when we talk about egg quality or healthy eggs, we're usually referring to genetics. Age is the number one, you can't help your age, but that's why the older you are, if you haven't gotten pregnant, you should go see a fertility doctor sooner. There may be lifestyle factors that impact egg quality, and I'm a believer in this research. So anything you can do to stabilize those meiotic spindles and chromosomes is better, and anything that breaks them apart is worse. So really clear data showing smoking, chemotherapy, which I know you can't help, marijuana, environmental toxins like BPA, probably other things like PFCs, are breaking down our egg quality faster. Things that can help, vitamins, nutrients, 
plants. So we want to take some of those supplements. We want to eat a healthy diet and give our bodies and our eggs the things they need. Number two, how long does it take birth control to get out of your system? Love this question because there is an entire arena of people, especially on social media, who are trying to sell you something to eliminate birth control from your body faster. I'm well aware of that. How we measure the elimination is something called the half-life. Half-life is the time it takes for something to be halfway eliminated from your body. So it's exponentially. If you said, here's the whole amount, the half-life is where you're at 50, then you'd be at 25, et cetera. And this is common for how we use elimination of drugs and other factors. It's how we know how to dose antibiotics. So in medicine, we talk about half-life a lot. The half-life of the birth control pill is really important. Most pills have a half-life between 12 to 24 hours. Okay, so not months, nothing you need to go buy a subscription birth control pill cleanse or a book or a course to take care of. So how the birth control pills work is you're taking a form of estrogen called ethanol estradiol and a variety of different progestins. These combinations work by telling the brain, hey, there's estrogen, so we don't need any FSH sent out. Therefore, no FSH, the ovaries stay in a dormant state and you do not grow an egg, you don't ovulate, you don't get pregnant. Other hormonal benefits is that because the ovaries in that dormant state, it doesn't make testosterone or androgens, and also the mechanism of the pills increases sex hormone binding globulin from the liver, and then it binds to free hormones. So very often people will have less bleeding, less cramping, more regular cycles or no cycles, depending on how you're taking the pill, and a decrease of any androgen-like symptoms. So you'll see dermatologists talk about the pill all the time for skin purposes. If though you skip a pill, We've heard of people who skip a pill and get pregnant, and that's because the half-life is actually really short. You need to be taking your pills around the same time every day. So this whole idea that it's gonna take your body a really long time to eliminate the birth control pill from your system is just false, and it's really people preying upon your fears, which I understand because I would be fearful if there was something I was doing that would hurt my fertility, and I took the birth control pill for years and I still take the birth control pill now because I believe in it and I'm not afraid of long-term risks with it. That's my own personal choice and I support everybody in their personal choice. We also put our fertility patients very often on pills to manipulate this cycle and get the brain to stop sending out FSH before IVF cycles so we can see an increased response and maturity and a better cohort of eggs. Take home message, the birth control pill is not hurting your fertility, entire video on that, and you don't need a purchase anything to eliminate it or worry about eliminate it from your body in any faster way. Okay, friends, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed our first Fertility Friday Q&A. Go to the community tab and ask your own questions. I'll be looking through there and pulling out the top ones. If you have any further questions on these topics we just talked about, ask them in the Q&A here and I'll happily answer them. Please subscribe, support the channel. You can feel free to follow me along on Natalie Crawford MD over on Instagram. And you can always listen to the As Woman podcast for more in-depth fertility-related information. Thanks, friends.